Hi everyone, it's Professor Permanton. In this video, we're going to talk about functions. So in this first section, we're going to talk about what is the idea of a function, what is the mathematical definition of a function, and we're going to observe how does a function actually give the relationship between one quantity and how it depends on another quantity. For example, you can have your height depend on your age, you can have temperature depend on the date of the year, and you can also have the cost of mailing a package will depend on its weight. So here's some examples of the height depending on your age. For this first graph, notice that the age is the horizontal axis, or those could be x values. So your age is in years, and your height is the vertical axis, or the y axis, and those represent y values, and this is in height in feet. The middle graph is giving a demonstration of what a function is with a graph, where you have the temperature of the day in Columbia, Missouri in May of 2010. So you have the dates listed as a horizontal axis, and you have the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit on the vertical axis. So it's a relationship between the temperature and the date during the month. And then we also have the weight of a package given in ounces and how much it will actually cost in 2014. So as we go through this video, we're going to understand that a function is describing a dependence of one quantity on another. And here are some examples of what a function can be. You can have the area of a circle. It depends on its radius. The number of bacteria in a culture will depend on the time. You can have the price of a commodity will depend on the demand of the commodity. The temperature of water in a faucet will depend on time. You can have the money that Alice makes will depend on the number of days or hours that she works. The voltage can depend on the current and resistance. And then you can also have the speed depending on distance and time. So since this is our first video of the course, at the beginning of every section you'll see a list of learning objectives of actually what will be covered in that section. So we're going to talk about what the definition of a function is first. So a function is a rule, or sometimes called a correspondence, where functions are represented typically with lowercase letters. So the generic ones are lowercase f, lowercase g, lowercase h, and so on. But if you're talking about function in terms of temperature, you might want to use a capital T to represent temperature. If you're talking about distance, you might want to use d. The letter that represents the function will just depend on the context of the problem. So the first definition is about a function and domain and range. A function is a rule that assigns each element, x is what we're going to call it, from one set A to another element from another set called B. And it's written as f parentheses x, or it's read as f of x. So the sets A and B are just sets of real numbers. The notation f parentheses of x is read as f of x, or f at x, and it represents the function value at x, or the image of x under the function f. The set A is where all the x values are coming from, or the input values, and this is called the domain. And the range of the function is where you're talking about the set B, where those are all the output values, which are f of x, or f at x. So how can you write the range using what's called set notation? The range is the set of all y values, or output values, f of x, such that, so the vertical bar means such that, x is a member of the set A, which was the domain. So this symbol means exist in, or it means member of the set. So we've already talked about different types of variables. We already talked about the x values that are coming from the domain, set A, and we're also talking about f of x, which are, we know, output values or y values, and those are coming from the range, or the set B. So the variable that represents any number coming from the domain is called an independent variable, the input values, and the variable that represents all the output values are what's called the dependent variable because those values depend on what value you substitute in for x into the function. So one way to think about functions is that it actually represents a machine. So the function is the machine. You are putting x into this machine or into this function as an input value. And so this machine can be a graph. It can be a table of values. It could be a formula. It can also be just a verbal statement. And it will output f of x, which is a y value or an output value. And so this value will depend on what x was plugged in into the function in the first place. And this is called function notation. The y is representing the output whenever x is input into the function f. So we say f of x is equal to this value y. So since a function can be thought of as a machine, you have all these different x values that are coming from the domain that you're plugging into the function to get output values y. Well, you can represent this function as what's called an arrow diagram, where you have one set A, which is representing the domain, and you have another set B, which is representing the range. 
So here's an example of an arrow diagram. That is actually a function. You have the numbers 1 is input into the function and you get 20. 2 you input into the function, you also get 20. You plug in 3, you get 30. And you plug in 4 and you get 40. And the arrows give you what the correspondence or the rule is that associates each input with an output. So notice that each input value is used. 1, 2, 3, 4 are all used. And they each go to one thing in the range. 1 only goes to 20. 2 only goes to 20. 3 only goes to 30. And 4 only goes to 40. So this is representing a function. On the other hand, this other arrow diagram, you have the same numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4 in the domain, the set A. You have 1 corresponding to 10, 2 corresponds to 20, and 2 corresponds to 30, 3 corresponds to 40, 4 corresponds to 50. And these 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 are coming from the second set, the set B, or the range. Notice that this arrow diagram does not represent a function because the input value 2 actually corresponds to two different values. The definition of a function was each input value is used, yes it is, and each input value corresponds to exactly one element in the range. Well, one corresponds to one thing, just 10, two corresponds to two different values, 20 and 30. So this arrow diagram would not represent a function. So let's look at example one. We're going to determine what the domain and range are and whether this actual this set of ordered pairs is a function or not. So number one, you have the set of ordered pairs, two comma negative one. 3 comma 2, negative 1 comma 4, 2 comma negative 3, and 5 comma negative 7. We know that the domain is a set of all input values. Well, if you input 2, you get negative 1. So 2 is the input value, so that's in the domain. 3 is an input value. Negative 1 is, 2 is, and 5 is. Now notice that 2 is used twice. When you write the domain using set notation with the curly brackets, you only list each element once. Even if it's used twice, you still only list it once. So 2 3, negative 1, list 2 only once, and then 5. The range are the set of all output values, or the y values. Negative 1 is an output value for 2. 2 is an output value for 3. 4, negative 3, and negative 7 are also in the range. Now we've noticed this already when we talked about the domain. The input value 2 is corresponding to negative 1, and the input value 2 is corresponding to negative 3. So again, think about the arrow diagram. 2 would have one arrow going to negative 1, and 2 would also have an arrow going to negative 3. There are two output values for this one input value, x equals 2. So this does not represent a function. So on the other hand, number 2, you have the set of ordered pairs, negative 7, 3, 0, 7, negative 2, 4, 1, 1, and 2, 1. The domain are the set of all input values, so negative 7, 0, negative 2, 1, and 2. So those make up the x values, or the input values. The range are the set of y values, or output values. 3, 7, 4, 1, and then you have 1 already listed, so only list it once. This does represent a function because each input value corresponds to exactly one output value. Negative 7 only corresponds to 3. 0 only corresponds to 7. Negative 2 only corresponds to 4. 1 corresponds to 1. And 2 still only corresponds to one thing, just 1. Now that we know that we have functions and we actually have function notation, we can describe a function using a formula. So evaluating a function, we want to find out what is the output value for a specific x value or input value. So in the definition of a function, we know that the independent variable is x, and we're going to use that as a placeholder. The output value is f of x, or y, and it's described in this context as a formula, 3 times x squared plus x subtract 5. That means you take the input value, you square it, then you take it times 3, you add the input value x, and then you subtract 5. So in other words, you're inputting some value, you need to square first, then multiply by 3, then you need to add what you're actually substituting in for the x value, and then subtract 5. This is what's called evaluation of a function at an x value. So let's look at example 2. Value of a function, let f be a function described by this function formula, f of x is the output, when you take negative 4 times x squared, subtract 3x. So number one, f of, or f at, negative two. You're taking all the x values and now you're making it a negative two. So that means negative four times x is now negative two. Make sure that when you substitute in x values or input values, you put them in parentheses. So you have negative four times negative two in parentheses squared. Subtract three times x, well, x is negative two in this context. So you have negative three times negative two. So order of operations, you have negative four times four plus six, and you'll get negative 10. So the input value is negative 2, 
the output value for negative 2 is the y value negative 10. And since we know it's a function, we know that this one x value, negative 2, will only correspond to exactly one y value, and the y value is negative 10. Okay, number 2. In this context, we're going to replace all the x values with negative x. Negative x is going to be the input. So again, take all the x values out and replace it with the input, negative x in parentheses. You'll have negative 4 times negative x in parentheses squared, subtract 3 times negative x. Now simplify. You have negative 4 times negative x times negative x is positive x squared. So negative 4 times positive x squared, and negative 3 times negative x is positive 3x. And so the output, when you input negative x, is negative 4x squared plus 3x, after you simplify completely. Okay, number 3. Let's say this time you input the value x plus h in for all your independent variable x. So this time you'll have negative 4 times, in parentheses, x plus h is the input, so x plus h in parentheses, squared. Subtract so 3 times x, well x is being replaced with this input, x plus h, in parentheses. So negative 4, parentheses, x plus h, all squared. Subtract so 3 times the quantity x plus h. Well, order of operation says do the exponents first. That means x plus h times itself. You have to multiply that out. So negative 4 times x plus h times x plus h. FOIL, so first times first, x times x gives you x squared. x times h will give you xh. h times x is another xh. And then you have h times h is h squared. So you, when you combine like terms, x squared plus 2x plus h squared, that's when you take x plus h times x plus h. You still have this negative 4 on the outside, so it's negative 4 times whatever the answer is after you FOIL. And then negative 3 is times the parentheses x plus h. We know we have to distribute negative 3 times x, negative 3x, and negative 3 times h, negative 3h. Well, we still have the negative 4 to distribute through the first set of parentheses. So when you do that, you'll have negative 4x squared. Negative 4 times 2xh is negative 8xh. And negative 4 times h squared is negative 4h squared. So when you simplify, there are no like terms. You have negative 4x squared minus 8xh minus 4h squared minus 3x minus 3h. That's the output value for this function when your input is x plus h. All right, number four. This is going to come up in the context of calculus quite often. So this is what's called the difference quotient. You have f of x plus h. Well, we just did that in the last problem. We're going to take this answer, f of x plus h, from the last problem, and then subtract f of x. Well, that's just the function itself. That's the numerator. And then you divide by h. So in the numerator, you have a difference. And then the whole fraction makes it a quotient. So that's why it's called the difference quotient. We already did f of x plus h from the last problem. It was negative 4 times to take all the x's and replace them with x plus h. So negative 4 times x plus h all squared. Subtract 3 times x. Well, x is now replaced with x plus h. And now in this new problem, we have subtract the original function. So subtract, the original function was negative 4x squared and subtract 3x. So it's subtract the whole quantity or the entire function. Now if you simplify, just like we did in the last problem, Negative 4 times x plus h all squared. Make sure you do the square part first. So x plus h times x plus h first. Get that answer. Then distribute the negative 4. You can distribute the negative 3 through the parentheses. Um, x plus h. So negative 3x and negative 3h. But then also you have a negative sign outside this parentheses when we replaced f of x. So distribute the negative through this set of parentheses. And now we'll make it positive 4x squared plus 3x. So this is what the numerator will be after you simplify. You have negative 4x squared minus 8xh minus 4h squared. That should look familiar because we just did that in the last problem. You also have minus 3x and minus 3h, but we also have plus 4x squared and plus 3x. And the entire expression is divided by h. Okay, Don't forget about the h in the denominator throughout your entire work. Now, if you combine like terms in the numerator, you do have a negative 4x squared and a positive 4x squared. That's 0. You have negative 3x plus 3x, that's also 0. So those two terms cancel out, and what's left over should only be negative 8xh minus 4h squared minus 3h in the numerator, and that's still all divided by h. And so one thing that you can do to check yourself along the way with these types of problems called the difference quotient is that all the terms in the numerator should have an h in common. You have a negative 8xh minus 4h squared and a minus 3h. They all have an h in common that can be factored out as a greatest common factor or GCF. So if you factor out the h, you have a negative 8x left, a minus 4h from the negative 4h squared, and you'll have a negative 3 left from the last term after you factor out the h. 
and it's all divided by h. Well, if you factor out an h, you're multiplying by h in the numerator, and you're dividing by h in the denominator. h divided by h is 1, so those two h's will just cancel out. And what's left over is what's called the difference quotient. So after you simplify this difference quotient, you get negative 8x minus 4h subtract 3. So this will have a huge importance in calculus. All right, let's look at example three. We're going to look at what's called a piecewise function. So it's a function that has its domain broken up into two different pieces, two or more pieces. A cell phone plan costs $75 a month, and it includes 10 gigabytes of free data. It charges you $15, the plan charges you $15 per gigabyte for any additional data used beyond the 10 free gigabytes of data. The monthly charges are a function of the number of gigabytes of data used, and it's given by this function. So C of X, the C of X is the output whenever you input X. So C of X is representing the cost. So the function name is C or cost. The function is broken up into two different formulas. You have one formula at 75. If the X value that you're plugging in is between zero and 10, including zero and including 10, because that's Y is or equal to, or it's a different formula, it's 75 plus 15 times the quantity x subtract 10 if x is greater than 10. So if the number you're plugging in for the function is larger than 10, you're only looking at this second part of the formula, not the first part. So the problem is saying, find and interpret in context of the problem the values c of or c at 4.5, c of 10, and also c of 15, and explain what the, the answers mean in context. So C of 4.5, notice that we're inputting 4.5, that X value that we're plugging in is between 0 and 10. So we're not even looking at the second formula, we're looking at only the first part that actually satisfies the X value. So if you plug in 4.5, the output 75, because the X value 4.5 is between 0 and 10. So what does this answer mean? The cost will be $75 as your output value, when the amount of data used is 4.5 gigabytes and that is part of the 10 gigabytes that you're getting for the $75. So if you're only using 4.5 gigabytes, you're not being charged any additional fee. It's just $75. Okay, in addition, let's say we wanna find out C of 10. Well, again, 10 is included in this first part of the function because X is equal to 10 is the right endpoint of that interval. And so the cost is still just $75. So if you're at the upper limit of what the free data is, you're using exactly 10 gigabytes of data, the cell phone plan will cost you $75. And so C of 10 is 75. And then the last one, C of 15, that means you're actually plugging in 15 gigabytes of data, or X equals 15. Well, we're not looking at the first part of the function anymore because the X value is larger than 10. It's X is 15, it's larger than 10, so we need to use this second part of the function or this formula. Well, we have an X value that we need to plug in. So you have 75 plus 15 times the quantity, x is being replaced with a 15, because that's your input value. So 75 plus 15 times 15 subtract 10. And if you simplify, you'll have 150. So that means your cell phone plan for that month will be $150 if you use 15 gigabytes of data. You pay $75 for the first 10 gigabytes, and you're paying another $75 for the additional five gigabytes of data to get up to 15. So one thing to notice about this last problem is that the domain was actually specified in the function. We had the domain broken up into two different pieces. That's why it's called a piecewise function. The X values between zero and 10, you're only using 75. And if the X values are larger than 10, you're only using this formula for the function. Well, sometimes the domain will be stated, other times it won't. So we're gonna talk about how do you find the domain of a function if the domain's not stated? Let's say the function is f of X is equal to negative two X squared plus three X minus four. If the domain is actually stated, it's stated explicitly, it'll tell you what X values that you actually can plug in into that function. Otherwise, you need to find out the domain yourself. So example four, we're going to find out the domain of a function. So to find the domain of a function, we have to go back to the definition of a function. The function's definition was all the X values were coming from a set called the domain if they give you a Y value, which was coming from the range. So we need to find out, are there any X values that do not have a Y value output? So let's look at the first problem. The function is f of X is equal to three X squared plus four X minus 17. Let's think about this. If you substitute in any X value that you want, any real number, 
Will you ever have a value that's undefined or doesn't exist? Well, the only couple things you have to look for so far in pre-calculus is that you cannot divide by zero. We know that that will be undefined. And we also know that we cannot take even roots of negative numbers. Those also don't exist. Those are complex numbers. And so we don't have any fractions involved in this function. We take the x value, we square it, then we multiply by 3. We add 4 times x, and we subtract 17. There are no even roots involved. There are no fractions involved with x in the denominator. So that means the domain is the set of all real numbers. There are no x values that need to be excluded from the domain because every single x value will give you an output value y. So it says express the answer using what's called interval notation. Interval notation uses parentheses and square brackets. And you're using all real numbers. So that means you're going on a number line to the left forever. So that's negative infinity. So with a parenthesis, because negative infinity is not a number. Comma, that separates how far to the left, how far to the right on a number line. Well, you're also using all the positive real numbers. So this will continue all the way up to positive infinity. And again, infinity is not a number, so it's open parenthesis. Or you can use this notation to represent the set of all real numbers. It's a boldface R. Okay, number two. Let's say the function is g of x is 3x minus 5 in the numerator, and you have x squared subtract 13x plus 36 in the denominator. Notice that this function has a fraction involved. You have 3x minus 5, whatever that output is, you divide by the output of x squared subtract 13x plus 36. There could be potential division by zero involved. So let's find out what x values, if we substitute into the function, the function g, will actually give you zero in the denominator because we know division by zero is not allowed. It's undefined values. So if you take the denominator, x squared subtract 13x plus 36, and set the denominator equal to zero, now you have an equation that you can solve. This has the highest power is two, so this is called a quadratic equation. You can try factoring. This has three terms and it has one x squared. So you're trying to find two numbers that multiply to 36, positive 36, and the same two numbers need to add to negative 13. Well, the numbers that work are negative four and negative nine. Negative four times negative nine is positive 36, and negative four plus negative nine is negative 13. So this is how it factors, x minus four and x minus nine. So you have x minus four in parentheses times x minus nine in parentheses equals zero. Well, the only way you can have a product that's equal to zero is if one of these is equal to zero. So x minus four could be zero, or x minus nine equals zero. Well, this tells us that x must be four or x equals nine. That means if you plug four into your function, you'll have division by zero. So that means the function at four doesn't exist. And if you do the same thing with x equals nine, if you plug nine into the function, you'll have division by zero. That means, again, the function evaluated at 9 doesn't exist either. They're both undefined. So you need to take x equals 4 and x equals 9 and exclude them from the set of all real numbers for the domain. So the interval would be negative infinity, all the values for x up to 4 on a number line, and then don't include 4 because x equals 4 needs to be thrown out or excluded. All the values between 4 and 9 are okay. And again, don't include 9 for the same reason as before. And then 9 to infinity. So this says in interval notation, all the values less than 4 are fine for x values. All the x values between 4 and 9. And all the x values larger than 9. So this symbol, the u, means union. You're actually taking these three separate intervals and combining them to say that's the domain of my function. Okay, let's look at number 3. This time the function is h of x is the square root of 3x plus 12 and then division by x to track 5. So a couple things we have to worry about this time. We have division in the problem, and we also have a square root in the problem involving variables x. We have division by x minus 5, so there could be division by 0. And we also have a square root 3x plus 12. Well, again, we cannot take the square root, even roots, of negative values. So x minus 5, if that's equal to 0, that's going to cause a problem. So if x minus 5 equals 0, we know x equals 5. If we plug 5 in, that's 0 in the denominator. That means x equals 5 is not in the domain of this function. And we also have to consider what values inside this square root are going to give us a negative number. So 3x plus 12, if it's less than 0, it's negative. So 3x plus 12, less than 0. Subtract 12 on both sides. Divide both sides by 3 x is less than negative 4. In other words, if you substitute in any value of x that is less than negative 4, 
it will be undefined because you'll have a negative number inside the square root. The function evaluated at 5, it's undefined. The function evaluated at any value less than negative 4 is also going to be undefined. Those values need to be excluded from the domain. So it's the set of all real numbers for the domain except for 5 and all the values that are less than negative 4. So how can you write this using interval notation? Well, the only values that are allowed are numbers that are greater than or equal to negative 4. So square bracket because you want to include negative 4 in the domain. So values up to 5. And then there's a problem at 5 because we know that the function at 5 is undefined. So then 5 to infinity are the rest of the values that are OK. So any value greater than negative 4, including negative 4, but not 5. So negative 4 to 5 and then 5 to infinity. And you want to group these two intervals together using the union symbol. OK, the last thing that we're going to talk about in this section is that there are four ways to represent a function. And we actually have seen a few of them already. We've talked about earlier that a function can be represented as a machine, but what can the machine actually look like? Well, we've seen that a function can be represented algebraically using a formula. So you could have a formula or explicit formula defining what the value of y will be if you plug in the x value. You can have a function that's represented in words, like we had with the cell phone plan problem. We also could have a function represented as a graph. And we also could have a function represented as a table of values, and that's called numerically. So these are the four ways you can represent a function, verbally, algebraically, visually, and numerically. So example five, we're going to represent a function in those four different ways, algebraically, visually, numerically, and also verbally. So let f of c, so c is the input variable or independent variable, and f is the function's name or the output variable, dependent variable. It represents the Fahrenheit temperature corresponding to a Celsius temperature, capital C. In other words, this function will actually convert input value Celsius and you'll output Fahrenheit degrees. We're going to represent this function verbally, algebraically, numerically, and also visually. Well, numerically, you can convert several different temperatures from degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. Well, we know that degrees, 0 degrees Celsius is 30, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the freezing point of water. These are other values that you can plug into the degrees Celsius and get the equivalent degrees Fahrenheit. So negative 10, input, output, Fahrenheit, 14 degrees. 10, output, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 20 will give you 68, 30, 86, and 40, 104. This is numerically representing what the function is. You're inputting Celsius degrees and you're outputting Fahrenheit degrees. Now, if you want to plot these points onto a XY axis or Cartesian coordinate system or XY plane, you have 0, 32. That would be when you input 0. So C is representing Celsius on the horizontal axis. Your output values are on the vertical axis, Fahrenheit. You input 0, your output's 32. If you input negative 10, your output's 14 degrees Fahrenheit, and so on. If you plot all these points, you'll actually see that all these points will lie on a straight line. And so this is what's called a graph or a visual representation of what is happening for converting any degrees Celsius to any degrees Fahrenheit. So since the graph is a line, we know that these types of graphs that are lines are called linear functions. Linear functions will have both a slope and a y-intercept, or a vertical intercept. The vertical intercept is 32, so when you plug in 0, you get 32. And we also have a way to actually calculate what is the slope of this line. So one thing that you can notice is that from the table, it looks like every 10 degrees Celsius, it looks like the Fahrenheit degrees is changing by 22. So verbally, you can say every 10 degrees Celsius change, there's a change in the temperature in Fahrenheit by 22 degrees. So that gives you a slope. The change in the Fahrenheit is 22. For every 10 degrees Celsius change, 22 tenths is equal to 1.8. So the slope of this line is 1.8. And so we, we actually can represent this algebraically now using a formula as a linear function. You have f of c as the function, so the output is Fahrenheit. When you input c, Celsius, 1.8 times the Celsius degrees plus 32, that actually will give you the equivalent Fahrenheit degrees when you know the Celsius degrees. So you can have 1.8 times c plus 32, or you can leave it as a fraction, 22 tenths times c plus 32. So it was 22 degrees Fahrenheit for every 10 degrees Celsius. If you multiply that number by c, the temperature in degrees Celsius, plus 32 
plus 32, you'll get the equivalent degrees Fahrenheit. And then the verbal representation can actually represent what the function is actually stating. You have the function Fahrenheit, you take the Celsius degrees, you multiply by 1.8 or 22 tenths, and then you get that answer and you add 32. So if you want to convert from degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit in words, this would say you multiply the degrees Celsius by 1.8 or 22 tenths, and then you add 32. So notice we've actually represented this function four different ways. We had a numerical table of values, we had a graph, we had a formula that was an algebraic representation, and now we actually have a statement that actually explains how to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, so a verbal statement. So this finished up our video on functions. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about graphs of functions.